Okay, we're with John Robb. Uh, he's um, the author of the, the book, Art of Darkness, History of Goth. And um, he's also, um, he runs uh, the Louder Than War website. We we interviewed a lot of the same people, like Jaw Wobble and Genesis P. Orridge, Anton Newcomb. Uh, I don't know if you interviewed Dot Allison. What's this? Uh, no, that's actually one that happens, but I've done the mm -hmm. others, yes. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. We don't want this. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. There's, a, there's an otter in the room. <laughs> uh, what's that? He said otter pilot. Yeah, we don't want that. <laughs> that was a mistake. Okay, so we're with John Robb. A lot of people, you know, we interviewed a lot of the same people. I mean, so like a lot of the... I grew up with uh, Anton Newcomb. I've known him since uh, the eighties, and and Anton, he's not really a goth, but he was influenced by The Cure and Joy Division and some of those bands that we're talking about today. And uh, John has a few books out. He wrote about the Stone Roses, um, the uh, Charlatans. He wrote about. He's written a book about goth, post punk, Manchester, just everything, and he has a. A great website. Everyone should check out Louder Than War if you don't know about it already. And John Robb's a couple years older. I mean, we have we should. He's born on May fourth. I'm May sixth. He's uh, three years yeah. older than me. And uh, a lot of goth people are born in May for some reason. Do you find that true? Yeah, I think it seems like these days everybody's born in May. <laughs> Everyone's a Taurus. We're the only ones left because we're just going to keep plodding along. <laughs> So um, yeah, so like the the book is out. It's out this week. Um, I just um, to let you know, I just saw Sisters of Mercy on Monday, and I saw Placebo the week before. So it's kind of like uh, a lot of the bands are coming uh, this week because we got Cruel World uh, this weekend. So I'll, I'll be there, and uh, be, I'll be repping hard for uh, you know this book here and uh, the telling people about the Cruel World people about all about that. And um, yeah, well, let me ask you. I mean, how did how did you get into goth? I mean, I remember in high school, when uh, uh, like a poetry literature class, they they asked us to um, put together like a like a collection of poetry of our favorite poets. So I definitely had like Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe. So that was like when I was like fourteen or fifteen. So when when was your first encounter with the with goth anything gothic? I think the journey for me, probably a lot of people my age, it starts in glam rock. So in the um, in the seventies, we'd be watching Top of the Pops, which was it's amazing. When you think about it now, a uh, TV program in the UK uh, where about eighteen million people would watch, and it would just play stuff that's in the charts. But the charts then was was David Bowie and T Rex, you know. So it wasn't underground. It was kind of really artful, brilliant music that somehow was in the top 10 because of Top of the Pops. So if you were 12 or 13, this would be your, your diet, glam rock, you know. British glam rock's different from American glam rock. I mean, it's not Motley Crue, bands like that. It's much more art school and art, artful. And it's, you know, it's, it, to me, it's an almost completely different type of music and an aesthetic. And glam rock became punk rock in a way. So a lot of the people coming into, into punk were kind of coming off the glam scene. So we're all like uh, punk rock as well. And goth was just just a continuation in a sense that it's like the freakier end of punk, you know. So for two or three years, it wasn't called goth. It just seemed a natural out outgrowth of punk. It was called alternative music and it was in alternative clubs. And then suddenly it became uh, goth. But, and that's why all the bands really hate the term because it informs goth bands. They, they're, already, they're already there. It's like when people... It's like when Christopher Columbus got to America and discovered America, but there's already three million people living there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, musically, I, I mean, some of the earliest stuff I got into, I, I remember buying Alice Cooper, Billion Dollar Babies, really early on when I was about 10. And, you know, Kiss was around New York Dolls. And so there was kind of like that thing. And then, you know, punk happened. And so there was like, okay, a lot of people that were in the, a little bit in the glam put on the leather jacket and then, oh, we're punk now. And uh, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff. So, um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, what, what was I going to say? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm mean, in this book. I mean, 
you don't really stay with uh, the music. I mean, you kind of go back and spend about three chapters just talking about all the literary stuff, like uh, anywhere from Lord Byron to Charles Baudelaire. So can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, why you wanted to go back and, and talk about the historical uh, uh, impact of goth uh, through through history and literature? I think more than any of the music scene, goth is a deep dive. I, I think a lot, a lot of other music scenes were very much of their moments, but, you know, a little bit of cultural, historical backdrop to them. But with goth, it, it does go back. It's the same kind of mentality. You know, people like Lord Byron or Edgar Allan Poe or all those poets or, or authors, what they were trying to embrace and what they were trying to say with their poems and their books was the same as what people were saying in that post-punk period. I think people kind of always embrace the melancholy and written about the dark side with whatever is the contemporary technology. And I think in, in my generation, that was music. You know, maybe the 19th century or 18th century was poetry, but the most readily available way of expressing stuff in an artful way was being in a band in the 70s and 80s. Whereas now it's, it's, it's going on to social media, so it's more like, you know, it's more pictorial now. But that time, 1780s, music was the way you did it, you know, so you could combine the music, the words and the music into, into a very powerful whole. And it kind of condensed and it kind of created what's become the platform for the culture, for what people know as goth now. Well, you, well, you mentioned um, before goth, I mean, we had, we had like punk for a few years and um, it seemed like punk when it went kind of hardcore in England, it, there was kind of like a, a sham 69 and oi thing going. And the, over here we had like ha ha American hardcore. And a lot of us that were into punk before didn't really go in that direction because there was, uh, you know, different musics going on. I mean, there were, I mean, I, I wasn't really a Duran Duran fan and I wasn't really, um, you know, new romantic and I wasn't really hardcore and, you know, disco was happening. I liked disco, but I didn't, you know, and, and, and then there was like Motorhead and like the kind of like what became like heavy metal, 80s heavy metal, which I liked a little bit. But um, so, I mean, yeah, you, like you said, they didn't really have a name for it for a couple of years. I went to the, in LA, I went to the very first goth club that I know of was called Fetish. It was like 1983. It was kind of like a, maybe like a bad case, early bad case type of situation. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so like, so, so goth was like the movement with no name for a couple of years there. Yeah, I mean, because it was just an outgrowth of punk, really. I think most people in in the late seventies, early eighties thought they were still in punk, really. I mean, that's when people talk about post punk now. I don't think there was a day where everyone goes, "Oh, punk's over now." It's post punk. It's the same with goth. I mean. They were all, it was alternative music and there was alternative clubs and alternative bands. And about two, three years later, it was like a retrospective term for a scene that was already there. So people like Susie, who is what, you know, probably the goth icon, can't stand the term goth. She hates it because they'd already been in, in a band for about four or five years before it called, got called goth. So it's, it's, like, it's like being put into a scene... That you, it's like being made to go join a club that you that you had no idea even existed in the first place. Do you, you think there was something about goth which, which uh, lent itself to the suburbs a little bit? It seemed like it kind of goth took off more in Leeds than it did like in London. It was you know, uh, and here uh, there were I mean, the Cure were always way more popular in the suburbs than they were like with the hipsters in the, in the center of the city, like in the main city. Do you think there's something about it, like the, the suburban urban uh, um, divide there? You think there's something there? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a generalization, but I think you could say that. I mean, the first golf club was at Leeds. You know, the Phono was before the back case. The back case is a key driver, of course, taking the culture more into the mainstream or, or, or to get it onto TV. But it's, it's all those bands, nearly all of them came from weird little towns in the middle of nowhere. And it's so like Battle House, you come from Northampton, which is like a, a a very quiet market town in the middle of England where nothing really happens. And I got intrigued by this idea that this kind of really exotic culture came out of a very mundane backdrop. So it's not like, uh, you know, in, in Northampton in 1977, there was a thousand punks and everybody's, you know, cajoling each other along to get to this freakier scene. There's, there's probably about 20 people in town into weird stuff and four of them are in, in one band. And 
And because there's no one around, you just there's no you don't form a band to get anywhere. You just form a band to do what you like the sound of. Because there's you're not in a city, you're not going to get a record deal. So you just have your own narrative. You make it up as you go along. And I think then you have longer to fester as well. You know, it's there's there's time. You could you could do gigs that don't work, or you could find a way of fumbling towards something that's quite unique if you're outside the mainstream. So a lot of northern towns it was in, weird towns and midlands and, and these kind of really odd satellite towns of London as well, where the scene started to coalesce. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and over here, I mean, Christian Death kind of started in Pomona, which is like kind of like East LA almost. Uh, and Danzig was like a New Jersey band. You know, they weren't definitely like New York. I mean, they probably played a lot of shows in New York, but they were kind of over the, across the the way there. So let, let's talk about a few of the early bands. I mean, you already mentioned uh, Bowie. I mean, what was Bowie Low like a big album for Goth? The goth thing. Oh yeah, Bowie's very important. I think, which is just right in, here in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there, there is, and that's one of the key records because, I mean, Bowie's already a driver in the seventies because he made amazing records. Um, he looked amazing, and also culturally as well because his interviews would be like a checklist of cool shit to go listen to, like the Velvets. Or the Stooges, who were totally obscure bands. I mean, if you were thirteen or fourteen, that music wasn't on your radar, and it was it was a crash course for ravers, like he said, in driving Saturday. You know, and it's but then what was really key, I think, the next step of his keenness was those Berlin records. You know, this dark, shadowy kind of music that he's making, minimalistic, future feeling music. I think that had a profound influence on what could be off, and it's also music that embraced a new technology as well. It was changing the way people kind of um, listened to music and heard music. So when when you get to band like Joy of you're not ostensibly a complete goth band, but again, a huge influence on the scene. Those records were like a Manchester version of Bowie's Berlin records. You know, they have that minimalism. They have like these kind of spooky, weird sounds in it. And it's, it's rock music, but not like rock music you'd ever heard before. It wasn't about bombast. It was about sensitivity and shadows. It was it was a different way of making rock music. And and there was uh, John Fox, Alter Vox. I mean, they kind of started out as a Roxy Music Bowie thing, and then they kind of morphed into and then and then Gary Newman kind of stole the thunder. But uh, there was that early three records of uh, Alter Vox that seemed kind of important because they didn't they, oh, they, they didn't really they weren't really part of the punk movement, but they were there at the same time. If you were if you were growing up seventy six seventy seven ultra box did actually feel sort of like a punk band you know they were sort of one foot in and one foot out it was really hard to place them they felt like something from the seventies but they felt so future that they couldn't be from the past you know I mean there's bands from the past that didn't, never sounded dated like as I'm looking behind you that Sparks album you know that I mean Sparks never sound dated they always sound of the moment but Ultravox um you couldn't place it. They look quite punky on the album cover, but not quite punky. They look slightly older, uh, but also because they had a keyboard, so that made it difficult if you were into punk, because keyboards were something that wasn't quite part of the punk narrative. But they made short, sharp, shock songs and sounded quite punky as well. I think they were like a stepping stone to something that was, that was uh, going next. So, yes, you could make a very good case for them as being one of, not, not a proto-goth band, but definitely an influence on the scene. And definitely a bridge from from Bowie, who seemed like a god, you know, like an alien. He was far out, huge rock star. And Ultravox are more down on the street. But it's, it's like a, it was like a, it was like an interpretation of what Bowie was trying to do, but in a way for, for the next generation and bridging that gap before people actually start to do themselves in the next sort of raft of bands. Yeah. Um, also, uh, um... At that time, seventy nine, eighty, I was really into Metal Box by Pill, and I always thought, you know, I mean, it was that record was so gloomy, and and it, I mean, it, I mean, there was like the dub stuff, and but I mean, the the certain drugs we were taking back then, you know, it just seemed like <laughs> it, it, that album kind of took you to a dark place, like, um, and so what do you, what do you think about Metal Box and its kind of influence on on this uh, this thing? Because I, I think. Yeah. People like that record. That was one record that all these bands that you talk oh, about completely. that we're into. 
Well, in a way, you, you could actually make an argument that um, the next kind of cheerleader for cool shit was, after Bowie, was John Lydon, you know, for three or four years. He was so at the top of the game, you know, he was he was like the Bowie of the punk generation in a way, you know, always going forward, always making amazing music, always shape-shifting his style and his image and, and, and the music that he made, but always being true to himself. And, I mean, he didn't last as long as Bowie has been as cutting edge, but there was definitely that period when he was. So Metal Box was an amazing record. You know, it's it's kind of gothic in a way, you know, with, with an IC on the ends, because it does have a gothic feel to it. So I don't mean it's loads of people dressed with T-shirts and skulls on them or whatever uh, people think what that goth is, but it's, a, it's, a, it's got a gothic kind of vibe to it, that re the record. Also, because it brought in all, well, that's a whole different raft of influences, you know, dub and funk and, um, and, and mix it with post-punk and crowd rock as well. So it opened the door to a lot of different sounds. And I know they were a big influence to lots of other bands who were very big in the early goth clubs or the alternative clubs. Virgin Prunes were massively into uh, Pills Metal Box. Um, Killing Joke, it's in there as well. You know, so so what they were doing, they were, they were definitely pushed the music forwards. And by, and by making an incredibly experimental record, but taking everybody with them, you know, they took, you know, that record sold 50, 60,000 at the time, which, you know, is not a million selling record, but it's a lot of 16, 17 year old kids going on a hell of a trip. I mean, that's a big jump from the Pistols. It's only about a year and a half afterwards. And they made a record that felt punk, but sounded nothing like punk. And it kind of opened a lot of doors for what would become next, the possibilities of sound, and what you could do with it. I, th I think Bauhaus will have a pill influence in them as well. Right. So, uh, yeah, and all those melted faces on the cover, uh, you know, and, uh, and you know, what... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean... <laughs> yeah. And, Stylistically, uh, sonically. And, uh, I mean... Like I mentioned, the uh, the drug take. I mean, I think the drug taken for me kind of like, uh, and even the anti nukem kind of got heavier in as we got into the eighties. And so, uh, what do you think about like LSD or heroin and how that's related to the goth thing? Was was that there? Was that like a heavy uh, thing? With, with was it more in the punk or was it also in the goth thing? The scene heroin. Yeah, I mean, the, well, heroin was. Was, is around, but never as big a drug as it, say, would have been later on. It was, I mean, maybe some of the bands are playing around with it, but it's it quite hard to get on the streets and little towns. You know, it wasn't it wasn't until the riots on the English streets in 1981, you know, when there's there's riots in nearly every town in the country, suddenly heroin appeared everywhere and it was a lot cheaper. So if you if you like a bit of a conspiracy theory, you'd wonder how the streets are suddenly flooded with a drug that makes you just lie around and do nothing. <laughs> Instead of going out and rioting and demanding your slice of the cake. So if you were very cynical, you'd wonder if that was a, a deliberate sort of thing that happened. I mean, the drugs that were sort of knocking about in the late 70s that people tended to take, but the speed was always around. And hallucinogenics, so acid or magic mushrooms. And goth is psychedelic. I mean, there's a very psychedelic sort of vibe about goth. I don't mean Paisley psychedelia or like, you know, hippie I, I, psychedelia. This is a dark psychedelia. So a record like Pornography by The Cure is a magnificent psychedelic record, but in a very um, late 70s, early 80s kind of way, it's it's a psychedelia of shadows, darkness, a psychedelia of intensity, and a psychedelia of going very inwards on a very dark trip. And that, that was great. You know, we were up for that trip. You know, a lot of people were up for that trip. Yeah, I mean, I mean, LSD, I mean, my experience of LSD is kind of like you, you have this trip, you basically you, you kind of feel like you're dying you know and you go through this thing and you <laughs> kind of come through this death and then you're kind of you survive death and you come out of it and it's like oh i'm not afraid of death anymore because i i just died yesterday you know it's, uh, it's that's what well, yeah well in a sense you could say that um that you know people people always go about goth being really dark and people being really miserable but it wasn't that at all you couldn't have the big themes you know um uh, like like sex and death but um, but but that doesn't mean you're morose. So you go in a golf club and every, everybody will be having a good time, you know. And I think there's that there's that saying in it that he who fears death cannot enjoy life. I think that that's probably a very very um, staple saying that runs right through this culture and right through the book in, in a way that you know once once you understand death and you don't pretend it doesn't exist like most post-war 
Western culture pretends nobody's ever going to die. But once you understand that you will die, it puts life into a very, very sharp focus. Yeah, o- over here they called the um, a lot of bands like Forty Five Grave and uh, Christian Death. They called them death rock. I mean, over over there there was. I mean, I saw some videos on YouTube where, where they were calling um, Southern Death called. They were calling it a positive punk. Uh, um, what what do you think about those labels and what, what why did positive punk uh, just go out the door so fast? I think. Uh... Labels are a necessary evil, really, because we need a shorthand to describe stuff. And we don't always have, uh, you know, 500 pages to describe something like the luxury of in a book. You know, so if you told me about a really cool band that's playing in your town, and I go, what they like? And, and we've only got five seconds to describe it. Yeah. You'll go post-punk goth, and I'll go, I'm interested, you know. So we all know it's a shorthand. We're not trying to imprison the bands into one style. If the band wants to do something completely different next week, that's totally cool with us, you know. So, um, so they're they're all they're all labels. No one's trying to box anybody in. The positive punk thing was an NME article written by Richard North, where he got bands. He was in a band called Brigandage, who were a great band actually. Just they just did a new track, which sounds as good as the old stuff. And um, Blood and Roses, and there was this kind of little mini scene in London in the squats where they were trying to find a, they what they perceived. Uh, Oi was a very negative, violent version of punk. It wasn't the way they wanted to see punk going. So the original tenants of punk, which is dressing up and having a good time, partying and looking for an optimistic kind of future outside the mainstream, they were called positive punk. So they kind of, so Richard in that piece, he sort of, those two bands are the core of it. And Southern Death Court were just appearing on the scene at the time. So he sort of said, you know, they're part, they're not, they're not in this scene, but they could be part of the scene in a sense, the sex scam children as well. But those two bands didn't really want anything to do with it. You know, they had their own sort of agenda. So, um, and you know, this, the other, uh, Death Rock was, well, that Christine Death came up that term. Even though it'd been a late 50s term, I think for those kind of Death Rock ballads, you know, so, which, so it'd already been around as a term. So it's it was just people trying to find a way of, those actually, you know what, when I think about it, those two terms are probably far better terms to see than Goth is. You know, but I suppose Goth obeys all the rules of a youth culture name. It's four letters. <laughs> it's short, isn't it? You can write it down really quickly. It's not complicated. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot, when punk happened, I mean, punk for me, like, happened more 77 to 80. And I was, like, because uh, I was born in 64, I was kind of on the sidelines. So I did I did see Bauhaus. I got to some birthday party. I saw a lot of uh, Susie and the Banshees, uh, Almost all these bands that you mentioned in the book, uh, and um, um, yeah, another record that I think is important is Nico Marble Index because uh, it's just so weird and just so non-rock, you know. Because there, there's within goth, there's also like a kind of a non anti-rock thing going on too, you know. I think in a lot of it, in some of the Bauhaus records. And what do you think about? Yeah. That? The- I think there was definitely something like that going on. I think um, I think uh, rock music in punk, you know, punk had the year zero. Let's not go backwards. Let's go forwards. Let's not be trapped by rock. You know, let's find it, uh, a new way of doing things. And that kind of fed into goth as well as a continuation of that kind of idea. So it was so no, Bauhaus is a great example of this. I mean, there's something very rock and roll about Bauhaus, but there's also something not very rock and roll about Bauhaus. Daniel Ash doesn't play riffs or guitar solos. He make, He plays a guitar these cool weird little textures and little chopping sounds and and he, he plays guitar like an artist painting a painting and i think that that's um you know that's really key it wasn't like old school rock music but it still has the dynamics of rock they're just different dynamics in a way so a, a lot of these uh goth bands sort of happened at the same time as mtv so i mean uh it seems like why the cure kind of broke through in America was because they were on MTV so much in the eighties and stuff. And I mean, goth was at one time was sort of um, maybe like a healthy um, alternative uh, counterculture thing. And then, you know, some of the bands that got on MTV, like, you know, uh, you know, I guess, um, you know, the Bauhaus, the, the Bolshoi, the cure, the, definitely the mission and sisters of mercy were, maybe bigger than some of the other bands because they were on MTV. They got more exposure through the mainstream culture. They got more notice. You want to comment about that? 
Yeah, well, especially the Cure, isn't it? Because the Cure broke through really massive, didn't they? They actually had proper, like, top five albums in America, didn't they? I mean, the Cure always had this thing where they, where they, they could do really dark, intense, quite experimental records, but they're also very good at pop music. So they somehow managed to make that balance without one thing wrecking the other. It's quite schizophrenic, isn't it? I mean, the Cure always swerve from one type of record to another all the time, don't they? But but it, it it sort of oddly makes sense. It always feels like the cure. But those pop records made a big difference and they got them into the mainstream. Whereas other bands didn't quite get those. I mean, and Bauhaus didn't they never really had a chart record in America. But that's the, the other weird thing about Bauhaus, especially from a British perspective, is uh, the band they were afterwards, Love and Rockets, were huge in America, but almost completely unknown in Britain. <laughs> it was, you know, so they had like a, a number two hit in America, but they never had any hits in England at all. It's uh so their story, from your perspective, is completely different from our perspective because Bow Wow's are pretty big here. They actually had proper hits. Well, let me, let me ask you. Yeah, I mean, like most of Bow House live here in L.A. Uh, you know, Lemmy moved over here. Billy Idol lives here. Ian Asbury. Uh, um, I'm friends with the lead singer of Dance Society. He lives here in L.A. A lot of these guys eventually moved to L.A. I mean, some of them had success here. So it was, it was like they were over here all the time. And then some of them have married American uh, wives, and and uh, take that off. Uh, what do you what do you think about what, what's the fascination with LA with for British people? I think um, when I was growing up, because I'm in mean, Britain, so dark and gloomy, and it rains all the time. That LA seemed incredibly glamorous, and it was sunny all the time. So this, this that's quite basic, and also because LA probably is the main. Uh, music business city in the world, isn't it? You know, probably LA and London in, in a way. And uh, they're, they're both for years and years with the key drivers. So for people my generation, it, it seemed like this incredibly exotic place to go and live. Um, and because all the British cities in the 70s were all broken and falling down, you know, it was post industrial decline. And LA from a distance didn't seem like that at all. But uh, I think that's kind of changed in the last few years because all our cities most of our cities are getting rebuilt in the last 10, 15 years. And they're actually a pretty good place to live now. So I think the next generation comes along. Yes, there are some people who moved to LA, but it's a lot less. I think the punk generation was the last, probably the last generation to be completely obsessed by this idea of going to live in LA. Right. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned um, Adam, Adam and the Duke Wears White Socks, but I think that was a great record. It wasn't a great punk record. I think people didn't know what to take of it, but I, I mean, there was a story. I mean, Darby Crash of the Germs went over to London in nineteen late nineteen eighty, and he was like, I mean, because things moved so slowly, uh, he was like expecting to see like uh, the the punk thing, you know, the Sex Pistols scene. But that had kind of people had moved on from that in in England, and Adam and the Ants were kind of like the biggest thing there. So when Darby comes back, he has a mohawk. <laughs> uh yeah and then i remember going to see black flag and at the end of 1980 and you know i saw like 100 mo darby was so influential you know everybody had mohawks then like at, at the this black flag at the starwood in 1980 and uh what well, well, well let me ask you about, just about and uh, um adam and the ants first album here was really a big deal it was like you know there was all the whole black flag kills ants stuff and uh, yeah. it was kind of it kind of hit LA like things changed around that time you know that was when that was a big I mean even though Dirk Ware's White Sox didn't really make an impact I mean Adam and the Ants Kings of the Wild Frontier was a big impact in England and also here amongst you know the people in the know and um yeah and we can you mention you can talk about Adam and how he's sort of part of the, he's kind of part of this goth thing and uh he's and he's kind of the bridge from Mark Boland, Bowie, and to the goth and the and what what we have now. Yeah, I mean that you could argue in a way that Adam Ant was the last of the glam rock stars in the seventies, you know. So, you know, because uh, British glam rock is is sort of petered out seventy five, but there's little bits of it kind of went on to seventy six, and Adam comes out in seventy seven, so he's. And he, there is, there's very, I mean, he's very Mark Boland. There's a lot of Mark Boland goes on with Adam. And Eno is well, you can hear Eno and Adam's music. But um, 
So, but, he, but in ways, he was the most underground of, of the punk bands. So when the Pistols fell apart, a lot of people went to Adam and the Ants because they're this really tense, dark, underground group, you know, and it's really hard to imagine that because he's such, he became such a massive pop star, just how bizarre they were. You know, they're the weirdest group in the country. But then, um, you know, so the first album, Dirt Wears White Socks, which is, which is just a really odd, off-kilter record, was a big punk record, I think. People always think punk is just loads of thrash guitars, which is fine, but it, it was a much more different sounds in the late 70s. Punk could be lots of different things at the same time. It had a punk attitude and a punk feel to it without having a wall of sound guitars. It didn't have to go really fast to be a punk record either, you know. But so when they did Kings of Our Frontier, that was a swerve. That's like when they went to Technicolor, and that record was huge in England. It was like number one for about 14 weeks in the charts. It was uh, just a really... Just one of the weirdest sort of switches ever from being like the most underground band in the country to the most mainstream band in the country. And it seemed like it all be done in about four weeks flat. Well, let me let me flash up a couple of 12 inches here. Here's uh Death Cult. I mean, it was it was originally Southern Death Cult, and then they became the cult and Billy and I saw Ian Ian Asbury was at the Sisters of Mercy show a couple of days ago. So do you remember when this record came out? And do you have any remarks upon it yeah it's a, it's a really good record but some death court was a really interesting band so after adam and the ants kind of went mainstream there was like a, a whole section of the audience uh didn't want to go with a band that went the mainstream because you know what people like it's so out <laughs> they always say it you know they want their own kind of, kind of band their own little secret band and southern death court just started to come out then with a tribal sound and a charismatic front man it was all in place. They picked up a lot of the ants following and they became the, the kind of main underground kind of band that people used to follow around. People would follow around the country but they'd take their sleeping bags, go to sleep in bus shelters and like a gang of people would follow them everywhere and they became like this really key band. They, to me, in a lot of ways, they're like the great lost band of, of that kind of early sort of alternative goth scene. You know, this... Um, they would, they would, they put out one single. It was a big record. Everyone's buzzing about it. And if they'd done an album, it would have been a big record in the scene. But Ian Asprey uh, left the bands and got together with uh, Billy Duffy and put the Death Cult together, which eventually became the Cult. So the more rock they got, the less words they had in the name of the band. They seemed to lose for every riff they added. They seemed to lose one word of their name. And 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 I mean the Cult are a great band as well. It's just. Um, it was just sad that we never got the Southern Death Court album before he moved on because there is an album, but it's it's kind of like sessions and um, demos and outtakes and single. So an an album with a linear production on it would have been like a really interesting record. And then I have uh, Bauhaus Cheese and Parties. This is like one of their last singles. They were, they broke up soon after this. Did you, did you see Bauhaus play? Oh yeah, I mean they're a great band, a really great live band as well. An amazing band, I suppose, almost arguably the quintessential band of the scene. I think one of the reasons I wrote the book was I wanted to explain to people that, you know, there was more going on there than just, you know, they, they have, they're very stylistic, of course, and they have a look that looks very goth and things, but to people later on. But but they were just dark glam, you know, and but the band was actually an art rock band. They were one of the great British art rock bands. Every track they do sounds completely different. Everything they do is like really, really original, and their playing was was amazing. And they were also very forward thinking as well. So she's in parties is is haunting, and it's also got that thing they're very good at is is doing dub. They sort of incorporated dub into their sound for a few tracks, and it's really effective. So the greatest part of that song is actually melodica. It's great that little middle bit where he plays the melodica and they have the dub bass line. It's really good, and getting that into the charts that was a hell of an achievement. And I got uh, the first uh, Sisters of Mercy, Alice. I can't see it here. There you go. That's a little bit better. Alice, Floor Show. You, you saw these guys a few times, right? Oh, yeah. They're, and, and they're a really interesting band. I mean, they were definitely the band that inspired the whole the lead scene, a very key band in, in that context. But also just really interesting what they were doing. I mean, Floor Show is, is still one of my favourite Sisters songs. The song about the dance floor at the uh, Phono Club in Leeds. It's, but it's also because he's such a great lyricist. It's they're very minimalistic, but also very multi-layered, the lyrics as well, with a sci-fi kind of twist to it as well, you know. So 
it's, I think it's a really um, amazing track. But and the sisters also did this thing where they, where they they were kind of an ironic take on rock music, but also a celebration of rock at the same time. A very difficult time road to walk. Um, because they had the drum machine added in as well, they never sounded like a straight rock band. They sounded quite um, futuristic again. You know, they sounded modern because not many people used a drum machine in rock music at that point. And it gave them this very cold, metallic kind of sound and, the, and then bass-driven songs on top. So there's, very, there's a post-punk thing about them and there's an experimental thing about them, but they also managed to make it in, into um, kind of pop songs, these weird off-kilter dark pop songs. So the book is Art of Darkness: The History of Goth by John Robb. Where where do where do people where do people find this book? Where can they order this book up? Let's sell some copies right now. Let's all you people <laughs> in the cruel world. Yeah. Let's get let's let's buy this book. <laughs> if you manage to find that we got somebody giving out little flyers of cruel world with the uh, mm -hmm. with a little code on it, which you could just get on your phone straight away. Okay. But for your listeners now, the easiest place to find it is probably Amazon. Because you know it's that's a place everybody can find stuff. But it's in Barnes and Noble and a few of the shops as well. And if those two don't work, just come to uh, my band camp, the Membranes Band Camp, and it's on there as well. We'll mail it over to the USA. And we sold. I mean, quite we've done like quite a lot of copies of the USA already on the band camp. So it's uh, it's definitely feasible to get the books posted over there without too much cost. But probably the easiest and cheapest way is probably Amazon. And the membranes is still going on, and louder, louder than war, louder than words, is is continuing. How do how do people contact you? What are, on uh, Instagram, John Rob seventy seven. That's the best way. That's the quickest way to come and find me. So J O H N R O B B seven seven on Instagram. Just come and find me on there. And if if you need to find any stuff, I can put you in touch. Okay, we'll put we'll put some um... to buy the book, etc. We'll put some uh, descriptions, some links in the description here, because uh, people should read this book. I read this book also really quickly. I while I was researching this book, I found out that Lowell Tolhurst from the uh, Cure has a book called Goth coming out in September. I read it real quickly. It's only two hundred pages. Uh, what what's your what do you think about that? The, him coming out with a book called Goth. Well, I really liked his last book on the Cure. I mean, it's um. I think it, I think it's getting to be. I mean, when I started this book, you couldn't even get a publisher to go near the idea of doing a book about the history of goth. So I started about eight years ago, and I did. I did email on Tolhurst about doing an interview for my history of goth book, but um, he didn't get back to me. But um, I'm, I'm interested to see what his angle in it is. You know, it's. Um, I just wonder if it's a bit of a cluttered sort of space now. But I suppose most goths have jobs now, so they can afford all the books. Uh, well, I think it's I think it's not as extensive. It's more personal. It's he only has one chapter about literature, so I mean you're doing okay. This this is definitely the definitive, and we'll and we'll see. Okay, well thanks for talking to me. I mean we're gonna they're gonna cut us off here, so uh, we'll oh, I see that. Uh, yeah, we'll see you in the real world, and again buy this book. Okay, see ya. Let's see. Thank you, thank you, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>